Welcome to this week's edition of Freedom and Prosperity Radio, the weekly radio news magazine that we put together here at the Virginia Institute for Public Policy so that you head on off into the barbecues of summer and the softball games or wherever you may be at the water cooler and are confronted with somebody spouting something that they heard at some political debate uh, about how the government can fix everything for us and you have the answers, just, you know, temper them. We try to also, by example, show you how to do it with a smile. Our first guest this week is the executive vice president of the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs. And I should uh, quickly remind you that all of our podcasts are up on our YouTube channel under Freedom and Prosperity Radio. And you can also read more about us at our website, tertiumquids.org. Trent England is the aforementioned executive vice president of the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs. Great piece uh, in uh, Hillsdale's uh, newsletter in Primus. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Electoral College. Trent, welcome to Freedom and Prosperity Radio. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing very well. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you very much uh, for putting pen to a an issue that has become, I, I think, somewhat of a popular pinata politically alliterative as we may get at that point um that it, that it seems easy to bash oh the trump campaign didn't win the popular vote and uh, that's why he stole the election and russian collusion on top of that and so on and so forth and the illegitimate presidency is built off of that uh not the first time certainly it seems to only happen with republicans um but uh, as uh, one of my statistician friends pointed out if you take new york county which is manhattan island and Los Angeles County, which is downtown L.A., out of the popular vote, Hillary doesn't even win that. Uh, so I guess this is exactly what the founders of this country were worried about, two, two big cities like L.A. and New York dominating a popular vote versus a, an electoral college, correct? Well, that's exactly right. I mean, one of the first things, I think, to, you know, looking for maybe common ground when you're debating the Electoral College with somebody is the fact that whether whether anybody likes it or not, the Electoral College worked just as it was intended to in 2016 and in, tw- and in 2000. And if you go back to 1888 or 1876, the same thing is true. It's not, it's not a fluke. It's not a misfire. Uh, you know, I've seen it called all those things by mm-hmm. some otherwise very smart political scientists, and that's just not true. You go back and read the founding debates, they were worried about big population centers. They were worried about regional politics, and that's why they gave us the Electoral College. Now, again, you know, there, there are other reasons why people might not like it, but I think it is good to, you know, to settle that fact right up front. In 2016, the Electoral College did exactly what it was supposed to do. Hillary Clinton had a narrow, uh, it happened to be urban, uh, coalition, and the Electoral College says we set a little bit higher bar to become president than just the most, you know, the, the, the most raw popular votes. You actually have to distribute those nationwide to, to some degree to win the White House. Mm-hmm. It, it, taking it down to Virginia's level, and I have a, a very deep thought question about the Electoral College that I'm going to save for a little bit, and regular listeners of the program may know where I'm going uh, with this, and it has to do with uh, the size of the U.S. House of Representatives. But in Virginia, I I think it's, uh, and if please correct me if I'm wrong, but one state, and I think it's Indiana, apportions its delegates by the way the district they represent voted. Uh, in it's Vir- it's uh, Maine and Nebraska do, do that, actually, Nebraska, but one for each so. congressional district. Right, and Maine is really only two congressional <laughs> districts, but Nebraska. But uh, in Virginia, had we done that, uh, Hillary Clinton still would have carried the statewide election and gotten the two Senate's uh, representatives, uh, plus uh, I think four other districts. And so she would have carried uh, uh, five other districts. So she would have carried seven out of the 13 electorals, uh, but there would have been some representation to the fact that a large number of the counties and congressional districts in Virginia supported President Trump's I- election. Uh, is there a an efficacy to that, or does that fly in the face of what the founders had in mind when they put together the Electoral College? Well, you know, the founders really wanted to empower states to, first of all, run their, their own elections, 
Uh, you know, it, it, the Electoral College decentralizes our election administration out to the states, um, which then, you know, typically is, is pushed down to, to the county mm-hmm. level. And, uh, and, and they wanted legislatures to have the power to figure out how to best represent their states. And, and, you know, Maine and Nebraska each have a kind of a unique political history and culture. And, uh, you know, I, I think the systems that they have work well for those states. It, it is not, uh, it's, it's not obvious that it's a better system, especially when you get to larger states and states where there's more partisan gerrymandering. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, uh, as, as you, as you look at the number of, of swing congressional districts versus the number of swing states and how many people live in the swing, you know, swing states versus swing congressional districts, uh, because because of our of our gerrymandering, which is a whole different topic, mm-hmm. uh, far fewer American voters live in swing congressional districts, which which I think for most states counsels against shifting to the congressional district model. But the founders did. I mean, they they left that power up to, to state legislatures. And if you know if, if the Virginia legislature wanted to make that change, uh, they they certainly have the the power to to do that. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you actually fore, foretold something we're going to circle back to in a little while uh, on Freedom and Prosperity Radio. Visiting with Trent England, Executive Vice President of the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs, great piece in Imprimus, The Danger of the Attacks on the Electoral College. One of the things that we've brought up here and uh, flagged out of Charlottesville, which is home to Jefferson and Madison and Monroe, uh, is that they and many other Enlightenment era uh, researchers had been dogged with the question of why it didn't seem historically democracy had succeeded as a governing process, though if you asked any individual person, do you want to be free, do you want to be self-determinate, they'd say yes, and then as soon as you'd give them a self-determining government, they'd start voting for more state power or they would just collapse the economy and, and go that way. So this Republican, this representative Republicanism that was uh, put together and I think embodied in the Electoral College was a way to you know, take away at least at the national level some of that uh, out of control populism that had dogged some of the democracies. Is that a fair point about our electoral college, Trent? I I think it I think it is. I, I think w- one of the things that I find absolutely fascinating about the electoral college is it, it is an area where the the founders uh, and even just the framers of the Constitution disagreed, and frankly. Some of them didn't really think that much about it because uh, just the way the the way the workflow at the convention took place, the electoral college was settled very very late in the in the convention, and uh, and wasn't subject to quite the same level of, of debate and discussion as, as some of the other things that we see. And it it was based on the great compromise that created Congress. Mm. Really, you know that's. Uh, they they had already hammered that out. They didn't want to go back through another process like that, and so they imported the the, the Great Compromise uh, to to presidential elections. But but it's it's certainly true both with regard to kind of the, the general intent of the founders, and I think even more importantly to how the Electoral College has actually functioned in our in our history. Which I think you know if you could bring Madison here today, right? He would be less interested in what he thought about it back then. Uh, he'd be very interested in seeing how it worked over time. And I think the Electoral College has been more successful than, actually, I think it's very easy to demonstrate, it's been far more successful than the framers of the Constitution thought it would be. And uh, and that's because it, it, it does exactly what you describe. It, it creates this uh, state-based, two-step somewhat more deliberative in a certain sense process to elect a president and it it makes it a little bit harder and I think this is really important a little bit harder for presidents to claim to be the dear leader of the United States right mm-hmm. you know to 
they, they like to talk about how they, they're the only elected officials that represent the whole people. But, you know, that's, as we were reminded in 2016, that's not exactly how it works. And I think it's a really good thing. Uh, you know, I think the idea that the president is, is supposed to be our dear leader and, and the executive branch is supposed to be in charge of everything, I think, is, you know, is, is uh, potentially disastrous. Mm-hmm. And I think we see a lot of negative effects of, of government creeping that direction already. Well, certainly since the 60s and perhaps even uh, through the Eisenhower administration and and FDR, thanks to, you know, the war, uh, we, we were certainly tacking towards the imperial presidency where, yeah. um, you know, outside of the executor of the government that was established and paid for by the Congress, um, they started to become the this world leader because all the other world leaders were despots. Uh, so yeah. why why wouldn't the United States have it? I, and I guess Trent, on an esoteric level, isn't that really what dogs the United States? Is that unlike all the other countries, even our allies, even the the Western allies that are relatively democratic, they, there is a despotism in their construct where rights are you know granted by government and or a king or a central figure uh, and that in, in in relations with them, uh, whether it's a, a prime minister chosen by the, uh, you know, uh, Knesset or uh, the queen, you know, chosen by, I guess, being descended from the German invaders of the, the 17th <laughs> century, uh, it, 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 it really revolves around the fact that our head of state is still a, a, a fungible asset and changes every couple of years. Yeah, and on a, on a regular schedule and with term limits, post you know because because people didn't like uh, what FDR did by running uh, for a third and then a fourth term, and mm-hmm. uh, and I mean it's 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 interesting when you go back and look at the what the founders thought about national defense. You know, one of the reasons why they they wanted us to be strong. And they wanted to avoid entangling alliances and things like that that George Washington talked about in particular was because they recognized that, that those kind of things embolden the executive and just naturally make the executive more powerful mm. vis-a-vis the other branches. And, and so, you know, it's not, we don't just want to be safe from foreign invaders because we want to be safe from foreign invaders. We want to be safe from foreign invaders because it protects liberty because it keeps the executive from aggrandizing itself. And, you know, and I think the Electoral College is another one of those those things that makes it a little bit harder uh, for for presidents to get out of control. But then, you know, as you say, I mean, it's not just such as war today. Right. It's the war on poverty. It's yeah. it's national service. It's all of these things that we see from the, the progressive left and even some, I think, on the progressive right where they want they want to centralize and they want to see government as this. Mm-hmm. You know, this Hegelian force that is capturing the popular will and dragging us forward and, you know, <laughs> yeah. Not, yeah. <laughs> not the vision of the American founders. No, not in the least. And it's interesting, your, your column in Imprimus talks about the Virginia plan, which was very much uh, a parliamentary system where, you know, once our assembly had been chosen, our Congress and our Senate, then they would choose their leader out of it. Uh, I, You know, I look at, you know, how the House of Commons works in Britain, uh, and I certainly see how the Knesset works in Israel. And especially when we like the prime minister of these countries, there's a fascination in America, uh, with some anyway, as to what our country would be like if if we kept the American people out of the messy business of choosing the executor of our government. Um, but but I think they wanted the American people to still feel involved. Uh, and I think it was really Washington who drove the idea that they that you not just pick a king as as they had tried to do several times with him after he won the revolution yeah yeah and and they didn't want the executive to just be the slave of congress right Mm -hmm. to just be an agent of you know congressional factionalism they'd seen that play out in some of the states during you know during the immediate post-revolutionary war period and uh, i mean there's you know there are some upsides to parliamentary government but the, the the downside is you you tend to have very weak executive leadership and, uh, and and you don't have the potential for that same separation of powers 
that that we have here. And you know, and it's interesting in, in Britain, and this is playing out right now in a couple of different ways. I mean, their you know their civil service is really its own branch of government. Yeah, um, which is which is very interesting when they talk about a new prime minister coming in and potential you know elections in the future. It's really you know it's, it's really the the monarchy which doesn't really have very much power anymore, uh, and and then parliament and then the civil service. Uh, those those seem to be the three branches of government in in Britain because they don't really have an independent uh, executive or or mm-hmm. courts for that matter. Well, and we sort of see the same thing developing in you know whether you call it the deep state, the swamp, or just the bureaucracy of Washington, uh, with congressional abdication over oversight of things like uh, EPA and Department of Education to the executive branch. They they have almost shepherded in an imperial presidency for their lack of desire to continue their congressional oversight. Is that uh, that's not overstating it, is it? No, I, I think that's right. I think that the the fundamental challenge of our time to constitutional government is Congress's uh, determination to that it that it serves their interest better to hand over their power to the executive branch. Mm. Uh, and you know, then then each member of Congress can be his or her own celebrity and uh, and avoid the the very hard work of making policy. Uh, I think yeah. I think that's I think that is the challenge to constitutional government today, and it's it's uh, it's hard to chart a course out of that. Uh, but uh, but I'm glad that I'm glad that the, the programs like yours are talking about it because you know I think oftentimes our political debates are kind of complaints about some of the the outcomes of these systems where the real problem is the system mm-hmm. uh, and in in our our wandering away from constitutional government. Trent, uh, Trent England is the executive vice president of the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs. Great piece in Primus, and you talk about Elizabeth Warren really wanting to federalize our uh, elections, and our own Senator Mark Warner has frequently teetered on this as well uh, in his discussions of election security. Why we the ink wasn't even dry on the WikiLeaks release on John Podesta's emails when he started talking about Russian collusion uh, in 2016. Uh, and I feel that that he's teetering on this idea of well, we should just take it over for security's sake. Is that a grave danger that we face? The idea that uh, we will be convinced as a vox populi that it's safer for us to allow the central government to handle all elections and take them out of our our poor easily hacked local hands yeah i i think it would be a disaster i mean i mean nothing short of a disaster for two reasons one is at least in a decentralized system if you know it, it is it is far harder to hack it and it is far easier to learn what works and what doesn't work um over Time. I'm actually here in Colorado today uh, because this is one of the states where there's a there's a big fight going on over this national popular vote interstate mm-hmm. compact that's yeah. trying to hijack the electoral college. And at the hearing, they had uh, one of the legislative hearings earlier this year. The elections director for Colorado was asked about election fraud concerns, and uh, you know, and, and these are these are these are fairly progressive Democrats. Uh, here in Colorado, but one of the things that they pointed out was, well, you know, Colorado decentralizes this, pushes it down to the counties, and that helps to keep it much safer than if the state of Colorado ran a centralized election system out of Denver. And I thought, you know, hallelujah. I mean, you've got some <laughs> progressives who, who actually, at least in this one little area, recognize that centralized power is sometimes uh, very, very dangerous. Uh, the, the other problem is, that you know, election election fraud can be a problem even when it doesn't happen. If people believe it's happening 
And the people in charge of elections can't prove that that's not true, right? Elections have to not only be honest, but they have to be verifiably honest, demonstrably right. honest. Yeah. Or else people lose faith in the system. And I think putting Washington, D.C. in charge of presidential elections really means putting presidential appointees in charge of presidential elections. Ooh. And, it, I mean, that that is not... Uh, that is not the direction that we want to move in our in our very divided, polarized country. Oh, absolutely. I think it just makes it even more polarized uh, than that. Talk about this compact. You know, it's interesting because it seems to track and it's gained more momentum than the Convention of States, uh, you know, a- attempts. Uh, and yet there are these uh, you know, states that are adding together. Uh, I guess they're getting dangerously close to the point where they have the 270, uh, quote, electoral votes in order to flip to a national public election. What is your feel for for where this is going, Trent? Well, I've spent the last 10 years working against national popular vote uh, because I am very concerned. It's it's very, they're serious, they're well-funded, uh, and, uh, and, you know, they, they, they spend a tremendous amount of money and energy um, lobbying, uh, actually, Republican legislators because it's pretty easy for them to, to convince Democrats, and especially after 2016, and that's why they picked up some of these uh, some of these states like Colorado, where Democrats have recently taken control, although Colorado voters are trying to put it on the ballot and repeal it here. But, uh, you know, they're, they're at 15 states, 196 electoral votes. They need 270 for it to take effect. It's, it's, it's possible, but very unlikely that they would be able to do that before, uh, the election next year. Um, uh, it's entirely possible that uh, that they could do it before 2024, especially if Democrats win more state legislatures. Uh, I you know there there are some constitutional problems with it, but it's it's anybody's guess. I, I never put my faith in judges. Uh, it's anybody's guess whether judges would actually strike it down, which is why I'm working so hard mm-hmm. in state legislatures to right. to try to help them understand why this is so dangerous. Well, because I could certainly see, I I could see the case where somebody would have standing saying, "My voice has been uh, disenfranchised," and hopefully getting it all the way to a Supreme Court. Uh, You know, of course, then, like you said, John Roberts becomes this scary wild card. You know, (laughs) is he the guy that says Obamacare is okay? Because I just don't want people yelling at me. Well, and the the problem is, is that that Fourteenth Amendment protection that we're used to seeing in election law cases only applies within your state. I mean, this is an interesting little oh, yeah. constitutional anomaly, right? You're protect- your state has to treat everyone in your state, um, you know, basically fairly. Um, but if, if your state and another state are aggregating all of their votes, you don't have any protections yeah. to be treated fairly vis-a-vis that other state government. And this, this is one of the reasons why national popular vote is not, it, it you know, it, it may it may be unconstitutional. I I have some arguments that, that I can make about why it it is, uh, but it's it's really it's kind of a constitutional jump ball. Yeah, it's uh, a, it, yeah, like you said, we can make a good argument against uh, why it's constitutional, and you know, probably hear a few reasonable ones why there's ambiguity to it. Hey, Trent, we ran out of time. I was going to ask you about uh, you know the size of Congress and and three times as many Americans and the exact same number of Congress people, uh, but uh, I think we'll uh, hold hold on to that till the next time you're on with us. Uh, Executive okay. Vice President of the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs. Thank you so much for for. First, the, the, the piece which we have linked up on the uh, podcast in Primus at hillsdale.edu, Danger of the Attacks on the Electoral College. Thank you so much for joining us as well this week. My pleasure. Thanks for, for your great show. And uh, coming up next, Antifa. Oh, that got your attention, didn't it?